Good evening and welcome to Mental Health, Wellness and Recovery. My name is Richard Weingarten and I'll be your host for tonight's show. Let me begin by making an announcement. America has a new national beauty pageant. It's called Miss Volunteer America and was started two years ago by Allison DeMarcus, who's the wife of Jay DeMarcus, who's with the band Rascal Flats. New pageant is based in Jackson, Tennessee. In two years, the Miss Volunteer America pageant has spread to all 50 states and the British and the District of Columbia. The new pageant puts the emphasis on community service. Miss Volunteer America's crown has the letters service on it. S for scholarship, E stands for education, R stands for responsibility, V stands for volunteerism, and E for empowerment. According to Lori Natale of Oxford, Connecticut, who's the executive director of Miss Connecticut Volunteer, the program seeks to empower young women ages 17 to 25 through educational scholarships and other opportunities. Unlike the Miss America pageant, Miss Volunteer America promotes service to the young woman's community and the creation of each candidate's own standard of beauty. Each contestant must show poise and appearance in a swimsuit and an evening gown. She is also asked how she stays fit and maintains a sense of well-being. On tonight's show, my guests will be Miss Ireland Janelle, the current Miss Connecticut volunteer, and Serena Charbonneau, who is a contestant for next year's crown. Ireland, what city do you come from? Hi, I'm from Danbury, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be doing a little tap dancing for us tonight, aren't you? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much that was great and how many years have you been tap dancing yes I started when I was two years old so about 16 years Wow and you're 18 now or 19 you just turned 19, 19. in February oh nice yes. okay my next guest is Serena Charbonneau welcome hi and you'll be a contestant in the 2023 Miss Connecticut volunteer contest in November right mm -hmm. now I see you have a sash on you're yep. Miss Wolcott Miss Wolcott volunteer I yep. see uh-huh mm -hmm. Okay, 
and you uh, you just you just finished up your graduate studies at UConn, didn't you? Mm -hmm. what, what did you get the degree in? What degree is it? I got my Master of Social Work, and we just had a great ceremony the other weekend. So now I am enjoying summer mm -hmm. for the next two weeks, and then I'll be excited to start my full-time job. And where will that be? Cornell Hill Scott. I'll be an adult outpatient therapist. Uh -huh, mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Then at this point, I'll ask you to sing a, a song for us. He said you got the goods to make the big time And then he puffed on his cigar We'll make a killing, we'll get to bearing I'm gonna make you a star To get to the big time you need big time books A shady accountant who can cook the books A couple of the well-placed friends Some dynamite eight by tens before you can reap those big time dividends I hit the right places, I cover my bases I do what I have to, smile till it hurts baby Wear shorter skirts baby, cry in a pinch baby But I won't dare give a single square inch baby Up here in the big time I Could you talk a little bit about poison appearance, which is part of the, the, the well, I should say first of all that the competition for Miss Volunteer Connecticut is organized in four stages. Mm -hmm. Poison appearance, the talent, you've, as you've shown tap dancing and singing, an interview about your work, and then your fitness, how you take care of your body and yourself. Serena, could you talk just a bit about poison ap and appearance? Sure, so for me, poise is being your natural self, how you hold yourself with grace. And for me, that's beauty. It's not society's definition when you look online and you see girls with the same filter and the same edit. Poise and purpose in this program is going on stage and representing yourself authentically. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that if you're being true to yourself, then you are being beautiful just as you are. That's mm -hmm. nice. It's kind of like your inner beauty comes out, doesn't it, if you're being exactly. yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add to this, Ireland? I absolutely agree with Serena. I think it's very, very important, especially in pageantry, to remain true to who you are and to not compare yourself to other people because I really truly believe, as we were talking about earlier, that you're only competing against yourself and you really, really have to instill that confidence within yourself and believe mm -hmm. that you are good enough. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you're, you've been tap dancing since the time you're two. It's a talent yes. portion of the program, too, yes. and you do tap dancing to that. What music do you play while you're tap dancing? Yes, so for the national pageant in June that I will be competing for the title of Miss Volunteer America, I will be doing a Spanish song. It's a little instrumental song to Santo Domingo. So mm -hmm. I'm very, very excited for that. But I've mm -hmm. done quite a few different solos, and the one that I showed today was dedicated to my dad. One of my favorite songs dedicated to him called Memories, talking about all the happy memories that we had together. Mm -hmm. Nice, very nice. And yes. Serena, you, you sang uh, Big Big time tonight? Yes, Linda and Etter. T t t how did you select that song? <laughs> Basically, I was looking for something fun to do. I think mm -hmm. with graduation and everything, there was a lot of stress, so mm -hmm. I wanted to pick out a song that I could do and I could perform and just enjoy. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the interview, Arlen, when you yeah. when you con when you were a contestant for Miss a Connecticut Volunteer, yes. uh, what kind of interview did they have for you? Did yes. They speak about it generally because we'll go into actually the your volunteer work later, but just what was the interview like for you during the c contest? Yes, so out of all the pageants that I've competed in, the Miss Connecticut, Miss Volunteer America 
organization has my favorite kind of interview. It's really just questions about you. The judges are really just trying to get to know you, the type of person that you are. And with that, volunteerism comes out. But they really just ask a lot about the resume that you hand in, about all the work that you've done, mm -hmm. and just kind of show the type of person you are and why you should be Miss Connecticut Volunteer or Miss Volunteer America. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. And Serena, how about you? What kind of interview do you expect to have in November when you vie for the Miss Connecticut Volunteer? Well, I hope it's exactly like Ireland <laughs> describes because uh -huh. I love talking about my volunteer work and how it's grown and changed throughout my life and my passions. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. We'll talk about that a little <laughs> later too. Now in terms of fitness and makeover, uh, you know, Ireland, mm -hmm. what, what do the volunteer um, uh, Connecticut judges look for in terms of fitness? Yes, they definitely don't look for the skinniest or what society would perceive as the most fit person. They look at the person who has the most amount of confidence. And I really think that the Miss Volunteer America organization tries to instill that everybody is beautiful. It's just showing that confidence and showing that you do live a healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add to that, Serena, in terms of fitness? <laughs> I mean, you've, you've had some body issues, haven't you, when you were younger? And yeah. could you talk a little bit about what that felt like and, and how did you handle it? Because obviously you don't have body issues anymore. Yeah, so growing up, and I think unfortunately this is true for a lot of girls, especially nowadays, I in high school struggled a lot with my body image and pushed myself to eat a certain way and to exercise a certain amount, not for being healthy, but to try to fit an image that I thought I had to be in order to be beautiful, in order to be worthy or accepted. And that took a lot of years to grow out of that negative habit and to focus more on positive self-talk and a more positive body image. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I really love doing is CrossFit, which for those of you who don't know, it is a lot of cardio, a lot of lifting heavy weights that look scary, <laughs> but it's exhilarating. It's a great competitive teamwork environment. Mm -hmm. And it has taught me to focus more on my strength strength and my size. Very nice. Ireland, how about you? How do you work out? Yes, I absolutely love weightlifting. So very, very similar to CrossFit. I work out about five, six days a week. I do weightlifting and I do Stairmaster for cardio as well as just any type of exercise that really truly makes me happy. So even if that is just taking my dog for a walk, I really try to listen to my body but also gain as much strength as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. And uh, going back to Serena, uh, you mentioned that you've done a lot of volunteer work in the mental health area, which mm -hmm. has kind of led you to choose the academic career that you've, that you've had, right? Talk yeah. a little bit about the mental health work you did in the schools. You were, were you working for mm -hmm. NAMI at that point or for more independently? Yeah, so I created a program called The Butterfly Effect. This was a year ago now. I created it, and it's rooted in the knowledge from my social work degree. So Gitterman's Life Model of Social Work, which is something all of us have to read as a social work student, talks about resilience and what that means. And basically, it's a culmination of your individual strengths and the supports you have in your environment. Mm -hmm. So I took that very complicated idea, and I simplified it by having all students, K through 5, color a butterfly. Mm -hmm. and I explained it to them by having them imagine themselves as the butterfly mm -hmm. and to think about their unique characteristics mm -hmm. and write down words or draw pictures inside the butterfly mm -hmm. and then outside of that is their garden or their people of support that they have that they can talk to and that they can rely on. I see. So the yeah. kids do the butterfly drawing, then they talk about their supports in the garden, the people that are there for them, their, their family, their friends, things like that. Exactly, and I even have a children's book called Scared to Be a Butterfly. It's mm -hmm. not mine that I published, but I love it. It's about a caterpillar and you're going through his emotions and spoiler alert, at the end, he does turn into a butterfly <laughs> and the kids are always yeah. so excited and that's also a great way for them to think about and talk about emotions in a healthy way. Did you also mm -hmm. get into the cat caterpillar stage before becoming a butterfly and what that's like? For me personally. You yeah, mean? but not with the, the kids, oh. not the young kids though, right? <laughs> Well, with the young kids, what was funny actually is a lot of the kids I've seen are first graders and that's the grade that they typically have the caterpillars in their classrooms and they learn about the different stages. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy for them to visualize that process and mm -hmm. how the different changes take place for a transformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Ireland, 
Serena talked about a book, and you have a book coming out, don't you? I actually already released it. Already released it? Yes. Wow. Yes. And tell me a little bit about it, please, and wh what you hope to accomplish by it. Sure. So about 20, in 2020, about January of 2020, I started writing this journal. It's called A Light for the Journey, and it aims to help grieving families cope with the loss that they've experienced. Now, I unfortunately lost my dad when I was 15 years old to esophageal cancer mm -hmm. through hospice care. And just five months later, I lost my grandmother also through hospice oh care. So those losses were extremely, extremely difficult for me to cope with, especially at the time I was only 15, 16 years wow. old. Mm -hmm. So I created this journal as a resource for grieving families because I mm -hmm. know how helpful journaling was for me when mm -hmm. I was going through my grief. Yes. And I wanted to share that coping mechanism with other people. Mm -hmm. When you journal, what did you journal about? Your, your feelings or your relationship with your father? What was it about? I definitely, I would write a lot about my feelings and kind of sharing my progress because I feel like, especially for the first like two, three months, I felt like I wasn't necessarily getting anywhere. Like I felt like I was just so sad all the time, which was to be expected. I had just lost my dad. So looking back at the journaling, I was able to see how I was making progress without even knowing it. And that kind of gave me the motivation to keep going. And I got back up on my feet. And in February of 2020, I launched my initiative at the Heart of Hospice, helping hospice family members cope, mm -hmm. where I've used that pain and that tragedy that I've experienced and I've mm -hmm. turned it into my source of motivation. Oh, very nice. And when you offer support to family members, is it through conversation or do you dance for them? Or how do you, how do you get to them and help them go through their own grieving process? There are a lot of ways that I offer help because I know that everybody grieves differently. So one of the main ways that I offer support is through my social media initiatives on Instagram and Facebook. I have a youth support group for teenagers who are experiencing grief. So mm -hmm. I meet with them, I talk them through their grief, and I really am just a shoulder for them to cry on, to listen, and to share my experiences as well. Mm -hmm. And in that support group, I also give them copies of my journal. So my journal is another way that I also provide that support for grieving I families. I see. Uh, very interesting. And the yes. teens must really enjoy the contact with each other too, going through a similar experience. Yes. I remember being a teen myself who had just lost her dad. Sometimes it's hard to listen to older people talk about their loss because even listening to my mom talk about losing her dad, she was 30 years old when she lost her dad. and at any age that loss is going to be extremely difficult but when you're a teenager it's a completely different ball game and it's very very hard to cope with that loss so mm -hmm. being able to hear it from different teenagers and to know that those experiences are not strange and that it's completely normal yeah. is something that i'm sure has definitely helped them and i know it helped me i'm sure not going through something alone also helps when you yes. see somebody else going through a process you know that you're not alone that other people are dealing with similar issues and looking for similar supports too right yes absolutely you know speaking of teens you've worked with teens too in the schools haven't you especially middle school and upper school students mm -hmm. or high school students and when you work with them what are some of the issues that you, that you that you focus on with them? So I actually just wrapped up, um, well, currently finishing up one of my part-time jobs at Wolk at You Services. This has by far been my favorite part-time position because it's what I see myself doing later on in my career, which is a lot of individual therapy, but also community programming. Mm -hmm. With these kids, I actually just wrapped up a self-esteem group. So like we were just talking about the body image, self-esteem is something that is a huge issue for that age group because their is identities are changing. Is it for boys as well as girls or just girls? Boys as well. Boys, as well. Mm -hmm. boys have, have, have body issues too? I didn't know that. Absolutely. It's something that can affect everyone mm -hmm. and it's important to validate that it can also happen to men and that men can experience a range of mental health issues. Um, I think that stigma of men having to be tough all the time is why younger boys might not feel comfortable going to the guidance office or coming forward about that. So we did have a group. The boy was outnumbered by the rest of the girls, but was an active participant. And we did a lot of interactive activities, which ended with them making their own T-shirts that had their own self mantras on them. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. well, give, can you give me an example of a mantra they might put on their T-shirt? <laughs> 
this is the first one that came to mind, but donut cry, be happy, and she drew the donuts, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's kind of neat. Yeah. And tell me, uh, we, you and I have talked about this before, but the issue of substance abuse and mm -hmm. how that's a problem for many teens, you know, mm -hmm. and do you think that because of the pandemic and that people were more isolated, that mm -hmm. people did things like try substances and, and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, use that in order not to feel so alone, not to be so afraid? How did that work and how do you deal with kids that have substance abuse issues? Yeah, so I think when we think of substance use with younger kids, we automatically think peer pressure. But I think now, especially with COVID, what we're seeing is kids turning to substances as a way to self-medicate and to try to cope with some of the issues they're struggling with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I've had kids in the youth center before where I'm talking to them about how, you know, substances are a negative coping strategy. And when you explain it that way, it makes a lot more sense. So if I ever had anybody come in who's struggling with a substance, we would work on finding more positive coping strategies for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, do, and do boys talk about that openly? Because I think when you talk about mental health issues, mm -hmm. I think girls are more prone to actually reveal their feelings and talk about their feelings with guys. And I know I, when I was in high school, you weren't allowed to express your emotions. If you expressed your emotions, you weren't being cool. Mm -hmm. Being cool was having a handle on your emotions. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's the story with young, young teenage boys now? What, what do they deal with and how do you help them overcome those, you know, those feelings of not wanting to be emotional, not wanting to show their, their real selves? I think that's a difficult problem because that probably contributes to increase in fights in school and more violent actions because that's easier than opening up and talking about your emotions. And in order to address that, I would just say by having others speak up more, sharing their own stories and showing others that it's okay to talk about mental health mm -hmm. and making sure everyone knows that there's a safe place in your school or in your community to go to. Do you, do you help them model by talking about your feelings at all? Yeah, so I actually, as a volunteer with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, I'm a certified Ending the Silence presenter. Okay. So that's something that the state does, and what that means is that myself and another presenter will go into school. So I presented in front of 400, 500 kids before. I'm very used to it by now. Wow. But I'll share my own story of my struggles mm -hmm. with body image and anxiety in high school and my journey of how I found mental health assistance therapy and how I'm you know have recovered and I'm better today mm -hmm. and how I'm spreading my story to help others and spread that message of hope mm -hmm. so that's very powerful for me and definitely contributed to my own positive mental health and I feel like it does have a positive impact on others mm -hmm. especially the ones that go under the radar unfortunately in the school system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and um, you know when somebody goes under the radar in mm -hmm. the school systems who catches them who 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 kind of puts the finger out to say they need help? Do you have, do the teacher do that or does there counselors that do that? Or maybe other kids do that? How does that work? I think it comes down to having enough staff to be able to do a check-in with everyone. I think in a perfect world, we would have enough counselors where students would check in with them twice a year, just seeing how they're doing um, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially, mm -hmm. and having that opportunity to show them that it's a safe space. And if somebody's doing okay, and it's harder to pinpoint the signs that they're going through a mental health issue, they might not get help compared to somebody who might have outward behaviors that need immediate attention. So unfortunately, in certain circumstances, I think it does bubble up until it gets to the point where it's noticeable. And by that point, it's it should have been addressed so much sooner. And mm -hmm. that's why we need more preventative measures in the school system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think the schools are responding well to the increased need for mental health services? I think they're doing the best they can. I know firsthand I worked under a social worker one of the years for my internship, and all the teachers and the staff worked incredibly hard. And I know that they were working to take care of their own mental health as well. Mm -hmm. So again, I think it comes down to having the resources to be able to do better, to help out more kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ireland, getting back to you, you know, you you were finished your freshman year this year at, at UConn, right? Yes, and yes. And you already know what you want to major in, don't you? Yes. Could you talk a bit, a bit about that, how you found out for yourself what you wanted to major in and what are you doing to achieve that? 
Sure. So I've always known that I've wanted to go into the healthcare field. I mean, my mom was in the healthcare field, and it's just something that I've always been kind of drawn to. But then especially after my losses with my dad and my grandmother, I just realized how much of an impact healthcare, healthcare workers really do have, not only on the patients, but on their families. Mm-hmm. So I, I know that I want to be in the healthcare field, but mm-hmm. to do that, I will be majoring in allied health with a concentration mm-hmm. in health sciences, mm-hmm. and I will be doing doing either an accelerated nursing program or a physician assistant, kind of keeping my op- options open for the time being. That's, that sounds sounds like a good plan. Now, getting back to you, Serena, could you talk a little bit about what would you say to girls, say 13, 14, 15, that are having body issues? What would you recommend for them to do or to think about? Mm-hmm. Well, first I would say you're not alone because so many girls are going through the same thing. and. I would say find a positive coping strategy that works for them, Mm. whether it be going for a walk, journaling, find something that's positive that can help them get into a better headspace. Mm -hmm. And Ireland, to to finish up, uh, you said that your dad was someone really resilient. Absolutely. Could you talk about his resilience and how you have learned from him to be resilient too? Yes, so throughout my dad's 18 month long fight with esophageal cancer, he always showed his resilience. He was optimistic regardless of the results from doctor's appointments and that resilience is is something that he instilled in me and it's something that helped me get over and overcome the great loss of losing my best friend. Thank you very much. Thank you both for being on the show tonight. I really enjoyed talking with you. Congratulations on your contestant win. Good luck in in Tennessee this this next week. Thank Uh, you you so much. You you compete in June, don't you, there? Yes, Uh yes, absolutely. Okay, and you compete in November for Miss Connecticut Volunteer. Best Mm -hmm. of luck to both of you. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for for viewing our program tonight. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you again next month. Thank you. Good night. (laughs) 